good afternoon. We're going to get ready to get going on this, our, our last program celebrating Black History Month. Um, it's been a real exciting season so far. Um, Beyonce's uh, video was released and there was a lot of dialogue about that. Maybe we'll touch on some of that today. Um, President Obama had an event where people said he was the blackest he's ever been. Um, somebody yelled out, hey, Michelle. And so, um, and of course, we have our ongoing issues around Black Lives Matters, which we will definitely get to today in this film. We're pretty excited to have our panelists um, today. Delia Konzek from UNH, film professor. Yeah. Uh, Joe Enesco, another UNH professor in education. And also a current police commissioner. So we should have some good dialogue there. I forgot my badge, sorry. Courtney Marshall, uh, another professor from UNH. And um, a new guest um, for us, because uh, we really wanted to have a young um, voice on our panel. And today is Camille, Camille Thompson, who will um, be talking a lot about the film as well. So um, without much ado, we'll just get started. Um, sorry, Kathleen, did you want to say something? I'll be happy to. Okay. So Kathleen, the director for the executive director for the Portsmouth Historical Society, will just say a few words before we get going. Thank you, Jerry Ann. This is so great. Um, I'm the new executive director of Portsmouth Historical Society, and we just are so so thrilled at all the great programming that Portsmouth Black Heritage Trail does. I just wanted to mention that TD Bank uh, is a fantastic sponsor for this series, and, and because of their sponsorship, uh, there is free admission for everyone, so it's access for all. But we do have a, um, a little uh, cash donation box there on the side. If you'd like to make a donation to the Portsmouth Black Heritage Trail, all the proceeds will go directly to them. I did want to mention very quickly that if there's a little hammering and banging, um, we can definitely stop that, but we're building the, uh, the, the um, uh, Tarbell studio downstairs in the ex exhibit that's getting ready to open this week. So let us know, and we will uh, definitely stop that noise. But if you do want, there are flyers in the back, so uh, this is going to be an incredible exhibit of Edmund Tarbell's work, and it's going to be opening this week, and it's our spring show. It goes until just after Memorial Day. Thank you so much for being here. A great round of applause for Jerry Ann. Thank you, Jerry Ann. Uh, we're gonna start off because our projector here keeps warning us that the ball um, is about to go. So we wanna just start off with just a couple of clips from Chirac. I don't know how many of you um, have seen the film because it only had a limited release um, of about 300 uh, theaters and didn't play very long um, in, uh, in the theaters. So we're just going to show to the microphone. Oh, sorry. We're just going to show, um, is this better? Okay, we're just going to show a couple of um, clips. Um, and the clips that were selected were uh, mainly due to show the linguistic performance. Uh, the film is all about performance, whether it's aesthetic performance, a dance performance, um, linguistic performance. And uh, so we, uh, we really wanted to show that um, and uh, what's going on in there. And so we're going to show just a, um, several clips um, that pertained uh, to this. So, um, just to because not everyone has seen the film, uh, what happens is, uh, the two gangs are finally forced to um, uh, give up because of the strike. And we then have this miraculous uh, element occur in which not only um, 
uh, are they given things, but they're given jobs. Jobs come to the community, the guns are turned in. Um, Chai Rack, um, the rapper, um, admits that he killed Patty, and um, uh, it seems like it's gonna be a, a kind of happy ending in some way. But me, also the protest has gone around the world. There's lots of, there's people in Tokyo protesting, saying no peace, no pussy, um, and, and, and all these sorts of things uh, in, uh, um, uh, in the Far East, in the Middle East, uh, all throughout the U.S. Um, you have people, and you see the protests spreading about. So um, maybe we can start the discussion about the film. Uh, when it um, came on, uh, it was, I think it was released, it had limited release, 300 <coughs> theaters um, on December 5th. But the trailer came out in November, and already then the controversy started. The Chicago Tribune, a, a lot of people were upset um, that, first of all, that it was called Chirac, um, that portmanteau with Chicago and Iraq. Uh, together. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people were upset about that. Um, a trauma physician, um, Amy Ho, a woman um, who works in the Chicago West Side uh, and deals with a lot of these victims, uh, wrote a scathing um, opinion piece uh, in which she said, this trailer is a disgrace. It um, is using for entertainment. Uh, and this is I deal with these trauma people and this is not um, it shouldn't be entertainment. She was also upset. She deals also with women who are abused. And she says, and to just say, um, to talk about the sex strike, uh, she really was upset about that. And to reduce women to simply biological functions. Uh, so we have um, uh, that kind of controversy. Um, it was well received um, uh, in um, film circles. Um, uh, people like Manala Dargis of the New York Times called it Spike Lee's finest film since Do the Right Thing and Malcolm X. Um, and it has received a lot of high ratings um, uh, from various film critics. Um, a lot of activists, however, some liked it, but a lot were upset, especially feminists, with the re, um, reducing of women to, uh, again, the biological function, um, others about Chirac uh, and all of that. And, so, and then um, there were some people who were upset with, the film opened with um, um, the voice that you heard uh, after the, um, the opening song by um, Nick Cannon. Um, it opened with um, the real voice of Michael Flader, the, one, uh, the father who runs um, the largest African-American church in South Side Chicago. Uh, and um, some complained that it was white savior, um, white saviorism, uh, and all of that. And, with uh, John Cusack playing him. So that was another controversy. So we can you know, discuss these various um, aspects here because it is, uh, it's a, you know, a, I think it's a really important film, brings up a lot of elements, uh, talks about um, activism, police shootings, um, black on black crime, gang elements, um, all these sorts of things um, as well as it uh, refers to uh, um, uh, various social media um, and the role that they, uh, that it plays in all of this uh, refers to uh, um, uh, prison. Uh, and, uh, we heard um, later where he discussed and it se said several times about um, uh, how uh, the mass incarceration mass incarceration is the new Jim Crow, um, especially with all these for-profit prisons uh, out there. Uh, and so we you know have a lot to discuss. Here. And it's also um, a, um, important also that um, R. Kelly was included in the soundtrack to this film. Um, R. Kelly, who's a popular um, singer who in, well, not even recent year, for many years, um, has been criticized for his role in sort of the widespread sexual abuse of young girls um, in Chicago. So that, for me, is also interesting. Part. And again, in thinking about um, how sexual violence um, intersects and works with the, the gun violence. Um, I think that's sort of the, and that comes up in one of the um, reviews that you, that you gave us in the handout. 
Um, this is the second one from the bottom, and it says, but my absolute favorite part is the implication that these men who are willing to shoot each other outside of an elementary school are dignified enough to not try and force themselves onto a woman if she says no. You must not know what it's like to ride the red line alone. So this notion that um, women can simply say no and have that no respected um, is something that I think needs to be further explored. I think Delia did a terrific job summarizing a very complicated film. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, handout you have, we put a positive review first, a couple of negatives, and then the last one uh, positive. Uh, hopefully you all got a, a copy. Uh, there's uh, a lot of disagreement about uh, this film. I, 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 I thought it was uh, really great. Uh, you know, I, I would have done some different things in the editorial room, but you know, that's just quibbling around the edges. Uh, it, it's a tough film because Spike Lee, uh, through uh, Father Flanagan's voice, Michael, uh, uh, John Cusick's uh, character, really lays out all the dimensions of this problem, right? I mean, uh, we're talking about uh, race, fundamental uh, structural racism in America, lack of education, school to prison pipeline, uh, inability to get loans, uh, lousy uh, health care facilities, uh, on and on and on. But then he takes the film, and this is where I think he gets unfairly criticized, and the film becomes much more narrowly focused on what the black community can do about the problem, and he implicates the black community in the problem. Uh, and so, do we now slide into a documentary and have even one-tenth of the small number of viewers that have seen it? Or do we get a little fantastic and we add some hip-hop and we add some music and we, and I, I really think he was trying to appeal to an urban male audience. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, he's got to worry about revenue. And uh, so I think Spike Lee was in a really tough place trying to please so many different constituencies and in our growing pluralist society, which in some ways is terrific, it also results in uh, some really unfair and severe criticisms of anybody attempting something as uh, uh, grand a statement as he does in this film. Uh, w one other thing before I pass this over. Uh, we've done this, uh, this is our fourth time. Uh, we, we started uh, with um, uh, 10 Years a Slave, we did, uh, 12 Years a Slave, uh, 12 Years a Slave. I, I just turned 60, I can't remember anything anymore. Uh, Django and uh, Selma. So this is our fourth uh, film discussion. And uh, so we like to start it out with uh, some comments, but really like to turn this into a community conversation. This isn't about us sharing what we know and uh, trying to look uh, sharp with some insightful comments, but to get a dialogue going uh, within the community. So I'll, I'll pass it on. Hi. Hi. Um, I, um, I think I enjoyed the movie. I, from a young person's perspective, I think I expected much more from it. I think I was disappointed with how much sex there was involved. Um, I think that this is a very important topic. I think that in the, I think us as a community, we hear a lot about police brutality these days. And I think it was good to hear or listen to some insight on black on black crime. Um, I would like to think that this is primarily my age group. Um, so it was, it was interesting to see how these women um, used their bodies as leverage. Uh, I don't think, I don't think this is the, that would be the way to stop black on black crime. But I think it was definitely interesting. Um, it was interesting to watch how they believed that no sex would persuade their men to do differently. Um, and I think, I think the movie could have been done better, I think. Um, I think that's all. I'm, I mean, I'm very, I'm very conflicted about how I feel about the movie right this second. Um, so I think that's all I have. So, um, does anyone want to bring up anything, um, anything of concern? Uh, mm -hmm. When I first heard about the movie, should I, should I pass the mic? 
No. <laughs> Hi. When I first heard about the movie, I was curious about the um, uh, the backdrop, uh, the um, the rationale for printing it in that form. So I decided to read uh, Aristophanes' work of the Sistrata, and I got through 50% of it, so I knew had an understanding of the lay of the land and what the um, uh, the context was. And then I saw the opening scene, and immediately I was appalled by the graphic nudity, the sexuality. And I'm thinking, as I'm watching it, that, gee, this is about people being murdered. And we've got this interposed with that, with that theme. And I just had to turn the movie off and just think about, OK, what is it that I've just watched? And how does this relate to what's happening in Chicago? It took me a couple of days to ponder that. And I got back, the, I got the courage to replay the movie and saw it from start to end. And overall, I think it's a great film, but I just thought it was a great distraction to the, of uh, given the problem to have all of that uh, debasement, in my uh, view, of women by the men. Uh, I have some other thoughts that I'll share later. Anyone else want to um, add to that? I just have an information comment, which is it's available on Amazon Prime, I believe. Stream, yes. Because that's uh, how we watched it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, we have a Prime account, it's free. He had a very limited release, only three, um, uh, 300 theaters. And he smartly, um, as an independent director, Spike Lee knows that, um, and he doesn't like to give up. Um, he usually he loves having to have written, um, produced, and directed his film. He, he really um, puts that forward. And he has tried to work with Hollywood on several films. His mo one of his most successful is Inside Man, and he um, is doing Inside Man too, which was a blockbuster. And he gave that up because they didn't give him full control. And so it is really interesting um, that he went with Amazon. And I think that was quite smart on his part, where he can get all of those uh, um, uh, aspects. But why don't we discuss that? Um, your name? Aaron. Eric. Aaron. 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 Um, Aaron brings up some good points here. Um, with the whole, you know, with Aristophanes, his using um, Lysistrata and this whole element with um, sex and bring in, you know, we're talking about violence. You know, why would Spike Lee, and there is a lot of graphic sex in the film. Uh, and because I was thinking of that, I'm going to show it to my students. I'm like, oh, I, I don't think I can. Uh, yeah, but, you know, like, you have to censor it so much. Well, we, why don't we discuss that? Because it is an interesting thing. Why would he do it? What does he get from doing that? Um, along with violence, um, because, you know, um, I would make the argument that, you know, something else is going on, and we can, we can discuss that. Well, I would say that it is impossible to separate sex and violence in American culture, um, in American history, particularly this history that's laid out for us. The history of African Americans is is the story of sexualized violence um, from the time African Americans have been brought here, you know, all the way down the line. Um, so, to, and also to think about even the, the figure, the Jennifer Hudson character, like the women show up as mothers and as partners, that is a sexual role. Being a mother is a sexual thing. You don't, you know, you get what I'm trying to say. But that is, that is sexual. Um, I think it's really um, sort of, I'm taken by the desire to censor, or not censor, but the desire to look away from the sex, because the, the film says, you know, the violence gets shown at 5 and 10 o'clock every single day. So I think it's um, something worth talking about, that maybe that's why the sex may, perhaps needs to be in here. So because the, I think the question is, why is it so easy to see images of dead black people, or black people killing one another, um, and that can be broadcast, and that's never censored, right? We never say, like, oh, I need to turn away from that. Or the news stations don't say, well, maybe, perhaps we shouldn't show this. Um, but black bodies, black flesh, you know, sort of 
black love, I guess, black joy. I mean, that's the, the things that gets me about this film is that the women then have to forego sexual pleasure in order for this whole thing to work, which, you know, I don't think that's cool. Um, also, one also the film erases, um, again, violent black women, again, right? So black women don't commit any violence, right? They're just there as the partners of the people who are committing the violence. Um, so I, but so, again, I just think this, this notion of um, what's, what needs to be shown and what you know, shouldn't be shown and what's debasement and what's respectable and how this all impacts this um, conversation about like, it almost, it almost seems like what is, the, what is the crime here, right? So let's think about black on black crime and black on black sex. So keep the sex. <laughs> Not touching that. Uh, so pick it, pick it up on uh, pick it up on that uh, pick, pick it up on that point. And I'll go back to what I made earlier. If indeed Spike Lee's uh, primary audience is young male uh, urban youth, uh, then there's got you know you've got to depict gang life uh, somewhat realistically, and that includes a lot of sexuality, regardless of what uh, demographic you're, you're in. And so I, I, I really think his, his message is to, is to young uh, urban males, primarily black <coughs> gang members in Chicago. Um, an interesting fact, uh, he started filming the, uh, this film on June 1st of 2015, about uh, 40 days later on July 9th, they were done filming in Chicago. And there had been 331 uh, wounded citizens of Chicago and 65 murders in 40 days. He saw all that. He worked with uh, Father Flager uh, intimately. He brought gang uh, members to Spike Lee. Spike Lee's learning curve was enormous. Um, and I really think the message was to the gang members. And so at the end, he says, stop the D&D, &D, the dumb, being dumb and, uh, you know, heading toward death and that uh, you're gonna either end up in a hospital or a morgue or you know, in prison. And uh, so I, I think all of these elements of hip hop culture and urban life had to be in this film to maintain the interest of the audience he most wanted to reach. And then I think it was also homage to uh, some of the incredible artistry that comes out of urban America uh, with the hip hop scene, the dance, the choreography, we miss the choreographed uh, 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 at the church right before uh, uh, John Cusick gives his speech. There's this spectacular dancing chorus, uh, just a, a remarkable uh, performance in the midst of this death. Uh, and so I, I think that, that that's how I would uh, suggest uh, why these elements had to be in there. Uh, they, they weren't for a suburban America or middle class America of any uh, color or stripe. I thought he was really targeting uh, the youth, urban youth. I think that um, sex was pretty relevant in this movie because I agree. And I think it did target young black men in the urban community. Um, I'm sure none of you guys listen to rap music or trap music, um, but everything, everything that was shown. It goes down. Oh, that's It does go down. Does. Um, I think it's real. I, if you listen to these rap songs, I mean, I have a 19-year-old brother. I hear it all the time, and it's all about money, sex, women, bad bitches. That's all you. Re that's all you want. And so I think it did a really good job of depicting on what black men like. And I think, you know, the more women you have, the more money you have, it makes you attractive. There was this scene that really um, s spoke numbers to me. There's a part in the movie where, the s so there are two groups. There's the Spartans, which is the purple, which is the purple gang, and. Um, Nick Cannon is a part of that. He's the, the leader. And by the way, Spike Lee did a good job with Nick Cannon's comeback. Um, but <laughs> then there's this other game, which is the orange, I don't know what their name is. But the women just, oh, well, the Trojans, okay. So they decide to go over to the Trojans leader's wife's house. 
and they're sitting and they're having wine and they're deciding that they're not going to have sex. And one girl says, well, if we're not gonna have sex with them, then they're just gonna go over and have sex with thoughts. And thoughts are them hoes over there. And that's real too, which makes me think that when I first thought about this and I saw this movie, I thought, okay, they're not gonna have sex with these women, but they're just gonna have sex with other women. And I think we could have talked, or he could have talked about that more, because I feel like that's why they would, yeah. Was having sex with them. Yeah, yeah, and so th there were a lot of men that just decided to go over to other women, and I think that's really how life is. Like, if guys can't get at one place, and they see that it's not, they're, they're gonna give up on this place and go to the next. So I think that was a part of it. This is one I, um, one of the things that struck me about the sex um, is I really thought of it not so much realistically as performance. I mean, this um, whole thing that he based it on um, Aristophanes' work on a performance piece. And you know, Spike Lee um, comes out of NYU, Tisch, um, which really puts, uh, um, really puts a mark on you. Um, the woman, you know, it, it used, they use a lot of the avant-garde elements of estrangement, of um, carnivalization, of debasement, uh, all these sorts of things. And all throughout, you can see how the mayor is made fun of. The mayor is also, and I was laughing, I said, like, God, I hope, you know, I wish that would happen to Rahm Emanuel. Um, <laughs> they make fun, use the sex also to make fun of the mayor, to deflate the politics, this sort of carnivalization going on. Um, it also is used very, you know, tied in with the violence, with, you know, the gun violence and, and the set, all of these things um, going in there. Uh -huh. And also, you know, the, the whole thing with them dancing, they're really doing what you call an, um, an aesthetics. Um, and they're taking that aesthetics and articulating um, a sort of politics, but they're turning it into a community spectacle that all of the community performs in. And that's, I think, what is so important um, about Aristophanes, where a group comes together, like in the church, and they perform together. Of course, that whole thing with the set, you know, makes it, well, you know, it, and, you know I, and I do see the problematic element. You deny sex to a man, and you really, you know, it is debasing towards women if you were, were to take it realistically. But I do think it has that avant-garde element of performance in there, of estrangement. Think of how he has split screen. Um, think of when they're dancing. It's all that mass ornament um, where the many act as one and all um, dance together um, in various sorts of things. It's a community coming together. Um, and think of how uh, it's also a satire. One of the things with satire is you take the lowest of the low, the physical, and you really put that forward. Um, it's radically democratic in that way. And it's also used to deflate. Um, you, it makes the mayor, it makes his henchmen, it makes them look ridiculous. Um, and it deflates, takes out that inflation of politics, I also think. If you, you know, if you look at it in that aesthetic performance, that way of, um, of um, urgency and all of that. And I do like how, you know, um, the posters that uh, have the you know beautiful pictures of the of um, Fiona Paris and on there you know no peace no peace you know um, where peace and and then also the, the slogan throughout which you, I don't think you could put on everything no peace no pussy um, it puts that that right there with the gun and the sex and all of that physical element that he really uh, I wouldn't take it too realistically it's not something like Fruitville Station which is much more uses um, elements of realism to create a documentary. This is a linguistic um, choreography, a performance, very similar in some ways, I think, to Beyonce's formation. And that whole thing, which is get in formation, it again is this performance of activity, of dance, and all of that put forward to react against something you know, that's an emergency. And I think sex is part of that. It's one of the most vital, um, vital elements. And I think if we look at it as a performance, even if we know that it's problematic and to reduce women, all, but I think it's more, much more estranged um, and seeing if we see it through a, as an art form, which I think Spike Lee is doing. And the director of um, formation is also um, um, 
comes out of Tisch um, NYU um, school as well, and I think this is what they're doing. Our colleague here, Professor Wilbur. Hi, I'm just waiting for the day. Um, I have three points. Um, I think this is a, a, a phenomenal film. I do believe that any work of art could be better, but I think um, for me what makes this work, this particular uh, work so brilliant is that it is so complex and multi-layered that it denies and resists a simplistic just out with the baby in the bathwater, right? Um, certainly I think there's some, some you know, there's some negative things in terms of the politics, the, the gender politics. Um, but I think you can't have a film like this and, uh, and for it to be perfect. I don't think that you can, no work of art I think is perfect. Um, I we think it's do the right thing when you yeah. don't know what is the right thing. Yeah, and you yeah. wanted to debate yeah. what is the I mean, the right yeah, thing. even as writers, we're never fully content with the work that gets published. And so, you know, I think if he's writing, I mean, if he's filming under 40 days, I mean, and you're talking about the learning curve, how perfect could a film like this be? But in terms of what's great for me, I think, first of all, black art requires an educated viewership. Um, and I mean, a type of education that I think that forces us to go back and understand, especially for someone like Spike Lee, what does it mean to have a double voice heritage and tradition, right? So he is playing with Greek tradition, yeah. right? And, you know, he's working with a black aesthetic, right? Things that are like the whole shy light reference. I mean, like that, if you were raised in a certain moment, that choreography, that, what he does, that is just fabulous. If you don't know the meaning of the shy lights, and if you don't know the significance of that moment in history in, in black music, right? Um, it's, he's also playing with um, the other film, the other with, with the young girl. Um, oh, what's the Crooklyn, Crooklyn, Crooklyn. Right, so he's playing with that whole, like the soundtrack of black America, right? That has a certain yeah. resonance, but if we don't know what that means, right, we can't fully appreciate the art of what he's doing. And so I think because he is pairing classical tradition with contemporary moment and a black art aesthetic, not necessarily black arts of the 60s, but a black art aesthetic, we have to know all three mm -hmm. in order to fully interpret what he's doing. So I think there's that. I think in terms of the, the sex, right, the, I don't see it as a distraction um, in, in many of the same ways that Courtney was talking about, but I think the ludicrous nature that this proposition of withholding sex. I think that is the critique, right? That that is even on the table as a possible consideration, right, for peace, right? And so then if we look at it from that perspective, then he's holding up a mirror to our, to culture, yeah. right? It's not so, I mean, if this is satire, right? Yeah. Um, we have to first know what satire is, but if this is satire, for me, it's not so much what's wrong with the feminist politics of that platform, it's that it's even up for consideration as a possible strategy. How bad is our society if it comes down to that being a considerable, you know, a consideration? And then the third and final component, um, I think the sex is a layer, much as we find in Shakespearean drama. And I think Shakespeare, I mean, I think um, Spike Lee is brilliant at that, right? Having these multiple themes that are sort of working themselves out on multiple layers um, in, in the same way that Shakespeare does, right? I mean, and how bawdy are some of Shakespeare's plays, right? Um, when we go to, to see white films, we're bound to see love scenes that have nothing to do with the plot, right? And we don't necessarily critique those, right? Um, and so what happens, why must Spike Lee have to aspire to, to something else that we're willingly paying money for in almost every other venue? Um, doesn't mean that he's not open to critique, but I think I'd like to see an analysis of the film where we really just put everything, put all of our predispositions around what a black filmmaker should do, right? And try the spirit, by the spirit, and attempt to see what is this artist communicating to us, right? In a very complex moment. Hi, uh, my name is Alex. I uh, haven't seen the film, but I, I did just return from the only museum of slavery in the nation, the Whitney Plantation, west of New Orleans. And I strongly urge you to, to look at their website, please. 
WhitneyPlantation.com because, as you would expect in this country, which has not come to terms with slavery, what is the crime? That is the crime. We have not come to terms. We, white people in this country, have not done that. And this rich um, white southerner for 15 years using his own money has created this museum on this former sugar plantation on the Mississippi River. Very powerful, especially the news uh, tab where you can see two short films, which I think really go to the heart of a lot of the things that we're talking about here. As they say, until the knowledge is there about what happened to the people who were enslaved and the legacy after the Civil War, which is why we have this horror today, until that happens, so my final question is, the new Museum of African American History that's opening next year in Washington, D.C., I assume there's some government funding for that, because there's been no government-funded museum of slavery up to this point. Governor Wilder tried in Virginia, kaput, back early in this century, just fell apart because it was government-funded. So are they going to deal with slavery the same way that Whitney has done, which of course doesn't have the constraints because it's a private mission, <coughs> but they've done a fantastic job there. It's very powerful. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is a comment from an re elderly retired white professor who thinks that my black brother has said everything that needed to be said, really. Because you see, in 2,500 years of written literature and history, we have not evolved morally. We've evolved technologically. We can commit our violence in ever, ever terrifying ways and kill more and more people. Although 28,000 got killed, I think, in the War of the Roses. And that's the 16th, 15th century. Uh, same that you have to have the sex because we are ultimately, whether we like it or not, and I don't think we like it in our modern culture, we are biologically driven beings, and sex is at the center of it. We're no longer different than grasshoppers or tigers or other animals. We have minds that want to deny that. And so when the feminists who complain that the woman was being reduced to vaginas, I see where they're coming from, but the thing is that vagina is an eternal symbol, just like the penis, of what pulls us together and pushes us apart. So that's why uh, the sister took and the other Greeks, yeah, they're writing for a confined environment. And every art work of art is a confined environment. You all know that. Uh, the end of the world's coming, and the, this one man has to go save his family, making his way through all these different obstacles. Millions of people die around him, but we don't care. It's about that one man and his family. The same thing with this film. Yes, that there are no there are boundaries to that black community in the film that are there for art's sake and for getting us to understand something about ourselves. Yes, we know the men can go elsewhere, but that's not what the point of the, the point of the film. I hope I made some sense. Loud <laughs> <laughs> voices in the back. Step up to the microphone. The question I have for the panelists is. I haven't read Liz Estrada. I've seen it performed twice. And the understanding I got from those performances was this, and it may be very subjective, that women seize the power that's theirs in an absolutely <coughs> unacceptable situation. And there was the kind of human and humorous element of withholding sex and what that means. But the bigger themes in that for me were women seizing power to participate in leading when we are not allowed to lead. And the second was they were refusing to participate in making more life because the situation was so untenable and awful that that was the limit they were setting. So I'm interested to know, because I haven't seen the film either, so I, you know, I wish I had, but I can't, I can't compare. I'm interested to know if those themes come through. Absolutely, I, I really think they do. Uh, there's a scene near the end of the film uh, where an older black uh, gentleman uh, confronts uh, Lissa Strada, the main character, and uh, he says, you're nothing but a little black bitch, and she slaps him in the face. 
and he backs off, and a couple of the other middle-aged men, one of them makes a comment about going back to his mother. And so even these uh, resistant male figures, middle-aged, the kind of the, the bedrock supposedly of the community, uh, they, they uh, deferred to the women, the, the, the mothers, the, uh, the life force of female energy uh, wins the day uh, in that exchange. And uh, I, I, think, uh, I think that those themes do come out in Lysistrata uh, quite clearly um, in, in and this I think film. In Chirac too. And in Chirac, yeah. And I met in Chirac. Mm -hmm. I think I can speak loudly enough. I uh, agree, I love the whole point about the women and their use of power using sex. Um, my daughter called it the new feminism. I'd love to hear her talk more about that. But one of the things that I thought was really powerful about the movie that doesn't seem to get addressed is the transformation of black men throughout the movie, particularly um, Wesley Snipes, who is the rapper who you know, has this sort of gang-like personality. But he goes through a transformation in this movie that's so powerful. You know, the role of the church in that movie is powerful. The transformation of black men, the community coming around, this mother, how she <coughs> loses this child, and what we have to deal with as a black community, how we heal, how we support each other, but how we deal with the ugly truth in our communities that we're killing each other. <coughs> and to see that play out, I think is not something that's talked about in this movie. Like, Spike Lee has this whole other layer going on that speaks to the black community. Here we are, you know, sort of in a very stupid and silly way killing each other. This black mother's pain as she's washing up the blood on the sidewalk of her child, the community coming around her, you know, the white priest sort of, you know, de you know the, the depth of the, the church, but also you have white friends who can be your partners in this. And then the transformation of the black man as he realizes he's a power player in his community. And until he admits that he is wrecking havoc on his own community, I mean, that's how the movie ends, which I think is just so powerful. That, that's, um, I think that's very true. Uh, the Wesley Snipes, because I've never cared for Wesley Snipes before. <laughs> he actually didn't have a huge airtime in here, but he was so powerful. And how he would play the role, and you know, and, 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 you know, be, he, you know, wasn't too smart in the film, and he would play these things, and he came around. And um, the Nick Cannon character, Chi Rat took much longer, but he then got down on his knees and asked for forgiveness. And when that Angela Bassett, that whole element there, I think with, you know, um, your father killed um, my, is it her sister? Her daughter. Her daughter. My daughter. And he came to me and he, that man was your father. And he finally gets down on his knees. And I think you get a little bit of it in where you have the wall. Um, where he, he's looking at it, and um, he holds out quite a bit, but in the end, he finally does, and he has to go to jail. You know, he they, they don't he get, he gets you know, and this is Strata is without <laughs> without a partner, um, and so I think that you get that the thing of sacrifice and all of that. Um, I, I thought that was I thought that was really powerful. It's a really <coughs> good point about the black males. Camila, did you want to add to that? Um. No, I, I don't think so. But why, well, what I did want to say, my mom just brought up the point of how I called it modern day feminism. And um, I called it moder a modern day feminism kind of perspective because um, earlier um, in my semester, last fall, um, I did a piece on Beyonce. Um, and I was speaking to my dad, and my dad was saying that Beyonce is a modern day feminist, and she has used her body and um, and sex to sell her music. And I am a huge Beyonce fan, so of course I had to think more about this a lot. And I saw that with these women deciding that uh, sex must be, could be one of the reasons that, or one of the, I guess one of the reasons why these men could stop doing what they were doing, I, Found it, I saw the power in it, and I saw how these women felt very strongly about it. So I thought that that could have been a feminist point of view. Um, and um, I don't know. I mean, I 
Yeah, I just lost my train of thought. Um, so I guess it wasn't that important. <laughs> um, I just have a simple suggestion. We have a wonderful resource in the Parksmith Public Library. I'm sure if somebody uh, requests the Portsmouth Public Library to do a showing, usually on Thursday evenings, and even have a talk afterwards, you'll mm -hmm. get lots of participation in the community to see the movie. You know, I thought we might try this interpretation on. <clears throat> Spike Lee really had no solution within the black community, so you go to this absurd solution where women, um, you know, uh, refuse mm -hmm. to engage in sexual activity. That was the only solution, because all of the other solutions involve larger structural forces <laughs> that are beyond the means of a black community that has been so oppressed and, uh, and uh, uh, abused for so many centuries. And so, and it also added some comedic relief because at the end of this film, it is a very powerful scene where a, a couple of the mothers who've lost kids say, be a good man be a good man. It is the ethical imperative you talked about earlier. We've developed technologically but ethically. And so it came down to that ethical moment and, and Nick Cannon's character steps up. Uh, and he, you know, he had to learn a lot of tough things about uh, his own father, how his, his own father had stepped up. So I don't know how you have that really heavy scene at the end of the film without some comedic relief in between. and. So it is this mishmash of stuff, and one minute you're tearing up, and the next minute you're laughing, and uh, the film's got you going in a million different directions, and uh, it's not the kind of linear uh, narrative that uh, we more comfortably watch with popcorn and a beverage. Uh, this is uh, much more upsetting. And I, I also thought the it was important to see the transformation of black men and I, I located that in the different um, sort of testimonies of the men who had been injured um, the, the man who talked about losing a spleen and losing part of his you know digestive tract that the film also shows the sort of um, sort of long lasting ramifications of this violence is not just that you know someone gets shot and they die and then the, you have a funeral and you go on to the next one but I think the film did a, a wonderful job of talking about how do you integrate those people back into this community, these people who are living and sort of are the sort of living emblem and representation of this violence, right? So I think that also gave an opportunity to see men caring for one another in a way that, black men care for one another in a way that we don't usually see when we do see these pictures um, on the news. Yeah, I think I can talk um, loud enough. I guess I really love the film. And I think why I loved it so much almost instinctively is that you can just sense how absolutely furious Spike Lee is at the violence. And so nothing seems to capture that fury except this satire. You know, this absurd, and use the term absurd. Um, all these absurd scenes because there's nothing else, as somebody else said. And then the other thing I think that's so powerful that works against almost all our analysis is my sister is incredible. I mean, she struts and, and walks across and knows exactly what she's going to do and how she's going to do it. And she's just a marvel. She's just a marvel. So you have to fall in love with her. <laughs> Uh, I, I was resistant to the idea of this film defensively because I often hear uh, uh, as a protest to the critique of uh, police brutality in black communities, uh, a criticism of the absence of public criticism of black on black crime. Because I hear it all the time in black churches, it is, it is never neglected, it is just it is just not part of the national discourse. It's not, it's not newsworthy. So it isn't widely known. And I felt that by creating a film uh, dealing with this issue, uh, Spike Lee was capitulating to those who would critique the, the black community negatively because this topic 
and its addressing in, in the black community does not get done. And I think that was a part of the comment that was passed along and made reference to from the young woman who said, this man must not have ever written on the A train by himself, uh, or the red line, whatever it was, A train, you know. <laughs> so uh, I had to get over that because I think it's worthwhile doing. But what we have here is a theatrical exercise because otherwise he's saying this is what you should do in order to bring about some change in this regard. And since he's not speaking realistically, he's not giving advice, it's just, you know, this nice fantasy, it's this exercise. It's, I haven't, now I'm saying all this based on what I've heard here today, because I haven't seen the movie yet. But it seems to me that of course it has to include all the violence because Liz Estrada is about, I mean, all, all the sex because Liz Estrada is the violence. And yes, it is really wise that he uses this, uh, this, this comparison with um, uh, uh, you know, the, the gang violence with the Peloponnesian War, which is also a list of straw. That's, that's just really clever. You know, so, so Spike Lee has his, uh, you know, he's, he's a gifted filmmaker. But I think that if you think this is what he's saying is a solution, that this is a way that women can use their power, that it really does not bring to mind just the reality of male violence. It doesn't quite address it that way. Uh, so, it, it ends up making me feel kind of sad because this is a very serious issue and it, and, and it affects people. This is real life and, and he's using this wonderful art form with this ambiguous effect because not everyone is going to see it with, with your sophisticated eyes. You know? and, and, then, and then where are you? I guess I wonder sometimes if, 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 if a film really does have a responsibility to try to speak, to try to transform society. Is that really a reasonable expectation of us to have of art? I think, I, I think somehow that, that, that it's supposed to, to try to do that. I, I think that any art has to try to touch us in some kind of way, otherwise it's not art. And, and ideally there's something positive that comes from that. Because, uh, I mean, that, well, I'm a minister. I happen to think that's what religion is, that, that, that connecting, that, that, in that sense, all art is sacred, or it should be. It should touch us. We should be moved. But I guess sometimes I think that it's, I wonder, is it enough to simply be moved? Should there be some goal, some, some accomplishment? I get frustrated. I, and I think that if I, I still haven't seen a movie, and maybe I won't feel frustrated. Maybe I'll just feel delighted. <laughs> it doesn't solve the problem. I don't think the message is ambiguous at all. I, I think you'll be pleased with the message. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Joe, jo, were you saying something? No, I just, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's just constantly hammering. Uh, the problems uh, of, of urban gang life and that this has to change. And I, I, I think the, I think the message is pretty clear. Um, that uh, I, I don't think it's an ambivalent message. Let me put it that way. Okay. Seems to me as though it may be relevant that I was reading an article and I could only it was six pages long. I could only read half of it at a time. And it was an Englishman who was a consultant saying the way that the American slave owners needed to treat the slaves. And the way you do that is you beat, you hang, you burn, you emasculate the males, you give the women the power and dominate them so that they will raise their males to be obedient to the slave owners. Now what's also relevant to this, the movie The Butler, his father is killed because the white slave owner is uh, raping his mother. So the tie-in between the violence that was used to keep the slaves in check 
and also to treat the women has a historical effect on all of this that we're looking at from my perspective because it has affected the way men see each other in the black community. I can't obviously say that. It's also affected the relationships as the families have emerged. When I see this, it is pretty shattering. The way it ends up that you've described, and I have not seen it, appears to be hopeful. But without understanding some of the context, it makes it more difficult to understand a lot of what he's trying to get at. Now, it appears that through history, the people who cannot fight back against the people who dominate them turn on each other. And so when we look at that, it helps to understand some of what's going on with black-on-black -black violence. Also, uh, when I was back at my college reunion, there was a young woman who asked if she could speak to me. <coughs> we had made some contact through music before that. But the story that she told me is one of the worst I've ever heard. And she didn't even want to go to this party, but she went, then was raped, uh, found herself out on the street, was mistreated by the women who were connected to the men. Being pretty naive, I thought that it was white men. It turned out that it was <coughs> black men who had drugged her and raped her. So, more power to whatever can illuminate what is going on in our society, and I thank you for showing segments of this film. And I've got to know, go see the film. <laughs> if I can look at it in one section, <laughs> like I could not read the article. respond to Reverend Thompson by saying it's making us talk yes. <laughs> and I think that is uh, the, uh, one of the values I have not seen the film I was afraid to go see it and I, I still am a little scared <laughs> because Spike Lee is not my generation and and speaking about this the sexuality I don't see how the movie could be made without it that's not the part that scares me. <laughs> it's all the rest of the, the violence and the emotional violence that scares me. And, and that's why I haven't been to see it yet. And I'll work up to it slowly. I saw the movie. I saw it in Chicago. I saw it during the first week and I went with a friend who happens to be into films, and she didn't want to go because some people in Chicago took issue with the word Chirac. They don't like the fact that Chicago is being referred to as that. Um, so she went to the movie uh, planning to not like it, but at the very end, she said she liked it. And so uh, that made me feel really good because I thought it was a good movie as well. I thought it was a good movie because it gives us an opportunity to kind of revisit what's going on in our communities. It speaks to the injury that we have as people of African descent uh, around educational institutions, uh, where during Black History Month, we're still talking about black history as if though it's not American history. It speaks to the criminal punishment system. So for me, I enjoyed the movie, but it was, a movie, and it gives us an opportunity to talk. Um, I like to underscore what the Reverend was saying. I don't think satire is the most effective way to address the violence that's going on in Chirac. I'm a resident of Chicago, just recently moved here, and I believe that, you know, it kind of trivialized the solution. 
or, you know, become saying that, you know, we do it with sex. We know it's going to take a very multi-pronged approach, you know, to correct the violence that's going on in this country and stuff. You know, and sex strike, don't know. Now, to echo what you're saying, I was very entertained by the movie. You know, I laughed. You know, it was fun, <laughs> you know, and because, you know, I like to see, try to find a positive or whatever, you know, but it's matter that, you know, and you address it saying that people in Chicago, there are people in Chicago, many of them will buy into the identifying the community as Chirac. They'll buy into it and stuff because, you know, there are many lives lost. When you look at the statistics, you know, it's a reality and stuff that we all, you know, recognize. We all acknowledge it. But to address the problem in such a satirical matter and stuff, I think that, you know, solutions are lost. I say, but, you know, because it brings the question, it had announced or introduced to many people the fact that this kind of violence is going on on a regular basis in Chicago. I mean, people, there are many people say, well, I didn't know. You know, I mean, those are people who are not connected with the community. Say, I didn't know. You know, so, but at the very least, it has announced to people that, you know, many of our communities, you know, are faced with these kind of issues of violence. And, you know, and it's just happened to be, you know, an overkill in the Chicago area. But, you know, glad that, you know, it's sparking the conversation. But when we start to get to the point where we're going to talk about solutions, you know, understand that that's not going to be <laughs> the solution, you know, to address these problems and stuff. So, um, On this issue of satire, I'm finding it very interesting because I was just talking to my colleague, Mr. Siobhan, here, and thinking about bamboozled as well. And so right. Spike Lee's use of satire to point to these issues and... Uh, I don't know if our film expert and you have also thoughts about satire and Spike Lee and the way he uses that. So that's one uh, question I have. Um, the other comment I have is about that brief allusion to that documentary about um, Liberian women uh, in the Civil War. Um, oh, right. um, yes. um, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, which I, which if you haven't seen, it's also an interesting movie. Um, so there's, a, there's that brief allusion there in which that is one of the things that the Liberian women did, right? They did hold a sex strike. Mm -hmm. Now, they did a lot of other things as well, right? They, <laughs> it wasn't like we're going to have a sex strike and do nothing else, but it was one of the many things that the women of Liberia did. So on the one hand, you see Spike Lee's film, and you say, satire, it's absurd that a sex strike becomes the solution to the problem. But then there's also that allusion to that film in which that is one of the things that women used. So on the one hand, it's like trying to juggle those things in my head, and you know I'm an English professor, and I'm having a help, <laughs> and I'm struggling to sort of put all these pieces together. But um, so I would like to throw those at, at the room. And I think that we have a question. Well. I just want to make a, a couple of points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just a little bit of background about me. I was born in Jackson, Mississippi. In the 50s and 60s, uh, saw a lot of uh, naked racism. In the home that I lived in, I was about a half a mile from Mega Evers' home, which uh, where he was killed. And two hours away to the north is Money, Mississippi, where Emmett Till lost his life. Uh, he was taken from his home at night. Can you just put the mic up? We can't hear. He was taken from his home at night uh, because he had allegedly whistled at a white woman at a store in Money, Mississippi. And um, he was, his eyes were gouged out. He was shot in the head, wrapped in barbed wire. The barbed wire had a metal fan attached to it. He was thrown in the river. And I was six years old at the time, so it didn't really strike me as to what had happened. And it wasn't until college that I felt the enormity of that incident and the killing of Medgar Evers uh, so close by. But um, my questions, I have a rhetorical question. Uh, the question is, um, okay, yes, violence and <coughs> sex are reality. But is that really a reality or a distortion of the reality <coughs> of the human being? The other point is, as I look at the movie, 
and I see the faces of the people in Chicago, I think to myself that a lot of those people immigrated from Mississippi, the rest of the South, to Chicago, Detroit, the other major cities. And they did so because they needed to get a new <coughs> start, find new opportunity. And in a crowded environment, with that kind of tension and urgency, uh, will arise violence. And it's just been escalating in sophistication and uh, the volume of body, bodies that have been murdered. Um, just something that the Universal House of Justice, which is the World Center administrative body of the Baha'is, from Mount Carmel in Israel, wrote this concerning the reality of human beings. This letter was written in response to a question by some people, I don't know from what community and what part of the world, but they responded with, indeed, the expenditure of enormous energy and vast amounts of resources in an attempt to bend truth to conform to personal desire is now a feature of many contemporary societies. The result is a culture that distorts human nature and purpose, trapping human beings in pursuit of idle fancies and vain imaginings and turning them into pliable objects in the hands of the powerful. Yet, the happiness and well-being of humanity depend upon the opposite, cultivating human character and social order in conformity with reality. Divine teachings shed light on reality, enabling every soul to investigate it properly and to acquire, through the exercise of personal discipline, those attributes that are to distinguish the human being. Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 You've probably seen me before. I just I wasn't going to say anything, uh, and I'm not a movie. I don't really care about movies. But I did see, see it last night because I knew I was coming here, and I wanted to have some idea of what was going on because I, I didn't feel that I could intelligently speak on it unless I had seen it. Uh, the excerpts were, were nice. It didn't cover all the graphic sex. <laughs> and all of the, um, I call it pornor pornography, uh, all of the, um, um, the language. And then the daughter of a minister, and living in a sort of a, sort of a close culture, um, and I think someone mentioned here that maybe this wasn't for certain people in the certain areas to see. And um, I lived under segregation, by the way. Uh, um, and I feel that in the, in the movie last night, right away I did, I'm not gonna like this. Number one, when the first part of it came up, I just had set myself up. But I wasn't really going to like this because I didn't <coughs> like the profanity. Um, but there is a message there. I, I, I felt it and I saw it coming from my background in a segregated, a segregated South and my experiences over many, many years of dealing with uh, the situations in this country. I, I felt it, it, the message was lost for me. <coughs> but the rest of you, I'm not taking anything away. How it was wonderful for you, fine. <laughs> it wasn't wonderful for me. Mm. And it wasn't wonderful for me because of my background and what I've experienced. Mm. I can see, I know, I've, I've been to college, I'm a retired school teacher, so you're not, I'm not speaking from not having been involved in education and involved with people, and, and I've had many years to do that. Mm -hmm. But the thing for me, just for me, not maybe for you, the message was lost 
in the sexuality and the uh, uh, the the, uh, the language. I wanted to. I really wanted him. Well, I wanted to see something where the, it was going to be addressed. The issue of all of this black on black. We need to. We need to come up. We need to say, hey, let's be real. Sex is not going to. It's not. Going, it's not the answer to the problem. I mean, sex is in our lives. We know that. We all are here because of sex. <laughs> but the point is. The, the brass tacks of life is that it's hard. Life is not easy. Langston Hughes, if you, if you guys remember that poem. A, exactly. So it's not a bad, it's not a bad of ease. But we have to, as black people, this is our problem caused by, I'm sorry, white people. Yes. <laughs> because they brought us here against our will. And so what did they create? They create what we have here today. And how are we going to deal with it? That's us. We, got, we have to talk about it. We can't, we can't, we can't put it under the, under, you know, hide it underneath the, the, the chairs or the couch or whatever. Just face to face, out there for you to see. And our young people, this young lady here, I was impressed with her. She was, she's conflicted. We don't want our young people to be conflicted. We want to give them our history, our real history. Not what's in the book, because in slavery, I've read books on slavery, and, and, and the slaves were happy to be in the shape that they're in. That's what they said. That's not true. You know what? I have to sit down here because I'm getting too involved. In But see, I think that, that's what makes the case for the film, right? I think that's what makes the case for the film. Is there any one solution? I want to submit by, by question. Is there one solution that would take care of the complexity of what we're dealing with? I don't think one person could come up with the solution. I don't think we could. Um, I'd agree that satire is not the most effective. I don't know any genre that is. I think we have to, artists have to use everything at their disposal to get what is happening today to happen, to talk, to flesh out what's complex, and hopefully from what we're discussing today, we can arrive at the solutions. If no better than to live our lives differently when we walk up out of here, right? And if Spike Lee can inspire that, then I say bravo and, and look forward to the next film. Um, I think that the beauty of it is, I don't believe that Spike Lee is proposing to offer any solution for these problems. It's too big. It's too big and it's too complex. We, individually, are too complex um, as beings. Um, I think the best that we can do is, here's an individual that is trying to utilize a medium to get us to talk and to get folk to think and to do differently. Not just listen and talk, but to do differently when we leave here. And if a film can do that, if a piece of art can do that, however flawed it is, bravo. And I think that is what we do in the humanities. May I introduce another piece of art? Thank you so much for mentioning that poem. I think this is the one you're referring to. I carry in my wallet. Langston Hughes, Mother to Son. Yes. Well, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up, in places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time, I've been a climbing on, and reaching landings, and turning corners, and sometimes going in the dark, where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't turn your back. Don't you set down on the steps, because you finds it's kind of hard. Don't you fall now, for I still going on, honey, I still climbing. The life of me ain't been no crystal stair. That's a beautiful poem. Yeah. I do agree with um, uh, with uh, uh, Reggie that um, 
as this sort of um, critical performance uh, that he's doing wants us to think a lot more. I do think he did that in Do the Right Thing. What is the right thing? You know, he put up Malcolm X or Martin <coughs> Luther King, and you know, part of the thing is why the why these two? Why only these two people? Why you know that we're still depending on them? And the question was, what is the right thing? Uh, similarly, um, in Get on the Bus. He really held up a mirror. Um, as funny as that film was, he also held up a mirror and really wanted people to think and look closely at them. Uh, and in this case, it was for the Million Man March uh, and all of it. And I do think that's one of the it is his aesthetics of, of performance and to get us to think. And thinking is not something passive; it is something active. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not this kind of distraction um, element, but it is one of outright performance, and you see it in the linguistic performance, uh, in um, uh, the dancing and the choreography, and I don't think it's meant to be solutions, but it is meant to somehow um, bring this sense of urgency uh, to the problem and to get us to think critically about all of that in the way that poetry, um, in the way that poetry does that. So perhaps one thing that we can do is sort of learn about sort of the ways that the humanities are under attack in our culture, the way that ethnic studies is under attack in our state, um, county, city, <laughs> street. Um, maybe throw some money in that box over there, right? Let's do that. We can do something differently. Um, but also, like, to go back to this idea of the humanities and, and what you said before about him putting this together is that what always strikes me when I teach, um, are, and so I, right now I'm at the um, the Concord Men's Prison and we're reading the Odyssey to me and a group of um, incarcerated men, and one of the things I sort of talked asked them was well, you know what was their experience with the Greek mythology and. Um, they were like, oh, you know, we love it. There are these universal stories. And I hear that a lot at UNH. It's like, oh, there are these universal stories that we can go back and we can, and we can connect with. And what, also, what always strikes me is I say, well, what about this story about a person of color set in your time period, in your, you know, in your country, and it always, they say, oh, I can't get into it. I don't understand it. This experience is so different from mine. So my hope is that one of the things that we take away from this film is really a, a, a more deeper sort of interrogation of the ways that somehow we can connect more, right, to an ancient, ancient tale, right? But there's something about people, flesh and blood people living in our country today that we don't feel we can connect with their story. That somehow Chicago is this alien place you know, these, these streets and these, these buildings and these people are just so different from us. But we don't think, wow, dude, ancient Greece, like, they're just like me, right? Um, and so I say that <laughs> it's true, like, you know, <laughs> I, and that's why I told the men, it's like, I'm supposed to think like Luke Skywalker, he's just like me, you know, Harry Potter, I connect, right? Um, but like, but if, but I'm, and I'm telling you, if I was to show this film in my class, they would say I can't connect with these people. I don't understand these people. I grew up in a small town in New Hampshire. I never understand what's going on. But somehow they understand like ancient Greece or Hogwarts, <laughs> right? That that's a mirror, right? And they feel reflected in that. So I feel like that can be. Can you talk about living our lives differently and, and maybe things to think about, things to do? Is actually to one to get more educated, right? So go out and go to Chicago if you want to, I guess. Um, support organizations that are doing the work in Chicago, right? So don't, let's not just sit and say, "Wow, that's a real shame about what's going on over there." But um, sort of see how how can we connect? How can we sort of build not just sympathy but empathy with these folks, right? I hear you know all this talk now about oh this heroin epidemic, and I'm like, I've grown up around heroin my entire life, and now y'all getting excited about heroin. Y'all wasn't excited before, right? But now there's a frontline documentary, and, you know, there's task force, and you know, we going all out, right? Um, so I think perhaps these these moments of, of really radical empathy um, can help us here. I mean, also, again, thinking about what is it about 
either the media or the way we read or our critical thinking skills that we need to we need to work on. Um, our media consumption, you know, I'm thinking about Melissa Harris Perry and like Nerd Land is no more. Like so we have these outlets where people are learning stuff and they're being slowly, you know, slowly taken away. Um, but again, thinking about where are those places in art and in culture where we are encouraged to connect uh, and other places we are where we're rewarded for not connecting, right? So we can just turn off our TV, right? We can go back back to our lives. Um, and it's, it's really interesting for me, again, as a, a black person who grew up in Newark, New Jersey, um, who has his own set, his own set of problems, who then lived in Los Angeles, who, then, who now lives here. So I'm really interested in what is the relationship between African Americans who live in places like this, right? And, and African Americans who live in these inner city areas, these sort of um, places that are sort of overwhelmingly filled with black people. Because I also think there's a way that films like this and, and the discussions we have also want to reward us for distancing ourselves from those people. Like, well, we live in New Hampshire. Like, we don't live in Chicago. Right, so I think that's another um, consideration that really weighs um, heavily on me. Terrific comments, and uh, that's how we also get all white nominees for the Oscars, too, right? Uh, lack of uh, appreciation. Apparently, many of, morning, many of the uh, People, voters, judges don't even bother to look at any film that uh, involves anything other than white uh, folk. Um, so uh, back to Spike Lee's film, and uh, I read a, a review, an interview, and he said, I don't have any answers. The purpose of this film is to throw out, essentially, all the variables. And he even there was even a scene in the film where uh, Angela Bassett is working in her garden, mm -hmm. and a uh, black insurance uh, salesman comes up from red, white, and blue uh, insurance agency and wants to sell uh, an insurance policy on her uh, would be her uh, her nephew, I believe, mm -hmm. and uh, she's enraged. So you know. Uh, the insurance agencies are involved. Here's a black salesman basically selling possibly her nephew off for money. Uh, the coffin store. The, the coffin store. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The numbers at the beginning of the film, 800 more people died in Chicago than, in, uh, than our soldiers yeah. in Afghanistan and Iraq together between 2001 and 2015. And he immediately says, the U.S. will spend money to rebuild Iraq, but won't spend money to rebuild our inner cities. And so there's that message as well. Uh, the south side of Chicago, I lived there for seven years. It took everything just to get a bank down there. And when the bank did come, remember it was in a trailer, like it could just immediately leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, it was, you know, it was just terrible. And the only thing that were out were liquor stores and check cashing. And you know, uh, uh, Spike Lee was uh, challenged by uh, Rahm Emanuel, uh, the mayor of Chicago. Don't use the title. He he threatened to uh, financially uh, refuse. There was some agreement that he would get some money, and uh, they threatened with tax cuts. They uh, they were, were going to refuse that. Uh, and he pointed out to Rahm Emanuel that the city, uh, you know, your hotels in the. Uh, in, on the wealthier portions of uh, uh, was it Michigan Avenue, uh, they're all doing just fine. They're absolutely loaded. Uh, so, sh you know, Chirac refers to a particular part of Chicago. Uh, it's uh, it's doing quite well. Also, Rahm Emanuel fought against uh, Karen Lewis and the American Federation of Teachers about a couple of years ago. They had a very important uh, strike. The teachers were not fighting over money. The salary component of that uh, lockout, uh, that uh, dispute, had all been settled. These were inner city teachers worried about the privatization of the public schools in Chicago. And Rahm Emanuel, that's a Democrat, and the Republicans together see a, a pool. It's a, it, there's a profit motive there. You basically had a public institution where you couldn't get <coughs> capitalists in there to make a buck. And we also have, so we've got a privatization movement nationally. We've got over half of our kids now, new report just out, over half of the kids uh, in the United States that are in public schools uh, uh, are eligible for free or reduced hot lunch. So our public schools, are, and, and our, you know, and our wealthier folks are sending their kids to private schools. I have nothing, you know, I don't hold it against them. You know, I love my kids too. Uh, but we've got a real a serious issue on privatization. We also have an issue of um, 
tax credits, vouchers, and other programs where we're taking public monies and giving it to private organizations, <laughs> including sacred organizations, and that's where you get some of these ridiculous uh, plantation stories in the South where, you know, they just loved it on that plantation. You'd be shocked. Uh, they actually were just workers. They shouldn't even call them slaves. Uh, that kind of literature is now being purchased on taxpayer dollars through privatization. Hmm. But uh, I'll stop my rant now. <laughs> Um, I think there's one thing about schools in New Hampshire that I just learned um, in a class last semester that when I, I grew up, I, was, I grew up in Exeter, and I know that during Black History Month, the only things we talked about were like uh, was Martin Luther King, we talked about Rosa Parks here and there, but we didn't talk about in depth about anybody else, and I learned that now in private school and in, um, public schools in Exeter, or just in our, I guess, you know, what else is there? Um, Dover, Rochester, anywhere around where we live, they don't talk about black history at all anymore. And I think that's a huge problem. Um, I had, we had lots of discussions in my class last semester of sociology gender, and the ignorance that some of the white boys had was amazing. And I had to look at one person, I had to say, well, I don't fault you, you live in New Hampshire. And here, you're not the minority. So, and, and I, you know, I feel good for you that you don't ever have to understand what it's like to be a black person in New Hampshire or a black person anywhere. But I think it's really important to have these conversations. Because um, if you don't, then you get a lot of ignorant people and then you get a lot of angry black people. And that's probably not what you want. Um, so I think, I think talking about it is very important because black history is our history. And I think people fail to remember that a lot. I would just say one other thing. Uh, in December of this year, the, our, our Congress uh, basically got rid of No Child Left Behind and raced to the top, and we now have a new program called Every Student uh, Succeeds Act. And in it, they basically have transferred power from the feds to the states, uh, and it's still going to be testing grades three through eight only in language arts and mathematics. So we've had 15 years now, essentially, of our elementary schools gutting the study of history uh, and science, frankly. A lot of science has been gutted as well. And so now's the time to speak up. Our state leaders now have the power. They can't pass the buck and say, we've got to do this accountability stuff and only focus on two subject areas. There's been about a 40% drop in instructional time in the social studies and about a 30% drop in science in our elementary grades over the last 15 years. And uh, I'm telling you, it's, uh, it's incredibly costly in terms of getting young minds receptive to all sorts of ideas. And the older they get, uh, just like adults, uh, you know, that, that old dogs learning new tricks. Well, the younger the kid, uh, the easier it is to get them to have a, a more open-minded attitude about a lot of things. Add music. Music, music, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Music and, and the music. Artists. Yeah. Any kind of, yeah. Any kind of uh, performance, and if we all, you know, critical thinking. Critical. Th uh, the Greeks did not see a difference between thinking and um, uh, um, eating and all of that. You know, and that's a thing of where it's. And I think that's one of the things about the film. Critical thinking is performance, and so you know, mm. this is what you know, the humanities. Um, brings that to you. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank my panel for this discussion. I want to just speak to two of my moments. One of um, synchronicity. Why we do what we do. Um, to have, she just left, but a black woman allude to a poem and a white man pulled that corn out of his pocket <laughs> was certainly a moment of synchronicity. <laughs> and it speaks to more that we can do as a community by being educated and by being willing to open up our mouths and speak. So I thank you for that moment. And the parting word came from one of our panelists. Um, go for it and have your moments of radical Empathy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just love that. Thank you. So we'll see you next week. And thanks for being here.